Genesis chapter 2. And verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto Adam. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. We are in the second of a series, four-part series, entitled Family Under Fire. I spoke on the formation of marriage. Actually used this same text, many of you. The formation. Going back to the very ground roots of marriage. It's really here in this text. This evening, using this same text, we're going to look at the fruit. Of marriage. Having looked at the formation, we now look at the fruit. If a tree is healthy, and the weather is cooperative, barring no insects or anything like that, a healthy tree should bear fruit. A tree is not bearing fruit and there are no ecological reasons as to why. Then we can only deduce that there's something wrong with that tree. It's unhealthy. In a very, very similar way, A marriage, a relationship between a man and a woman, marriage, should produce fruit. There should be certain fruit that comes from the relationship between husband and wife. Tonight that's what we're going to focus on. Fruit of marriage. There are, I think there's five of them. There are five things that should emulate or come from a healthy marriage. One of them, it'll be our first one we'll look at, 
simply because it fits within the text, is the fruit of companionship. Companionship. We all need companions. We do. And one of the reasons for marriage is that it produces us a companion. Look again in verse 18. And the Lord God said, watch this, it is not good that the man should be alone. And and the word man here just refers to mankind. It's humankind. It's not just the male. It's not saying, well, it's okay. It's okay for a woman to be alone, but but a man shouldn't be. No, that's not what it's saying. He's saying that for the majority of people, it's not a good thing for them to be alone. Because we need a companion. That's why when I talk to young people, when I counsel them before marriage, One of the things that I try so hard to drive home to those young people is the importance of being each other's best friend. Your spouse ought to be the best friend you have on earth outside of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the ultimate friend. He is a friend that Sticketh closer than a brother. He is our best friend. We played just a moment ago the beautiful hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But apart from, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, the best friend we should have on earth is our companion, our spouse. Because best friends... Or someone that we can go and we can talk to. And we can do so without any fear. That they're going to run off and and, and tell things that shouldn't be told. Or or they're going to give us some advice that's not good. Best friends don't do that. And our relationship should be as such with our spouse that we can talk to them about anything. Anything. God said it's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to create him a best friend. Companionship. I want to go just a little farther and we'll go to the second point. If in a marriage... Your spouse is not your best friend. It's unhealthy. It really is. And remember we talked about the fruit of marriage and how important it was to have a healthy relationship. If they are not your best friend, it's unhealthy. The fruit of companionship. Second, second there's the fruit of cooperation. Seeing that Adam was incomplete, God said in verse 18, I will make him a help. I'm going to stop there. Because we'll go farther in a moment. And the third point. Just stop on the word help. I will make him an help. That word literally means a helper. A helper. Now let me... Let me make you aware of something here. The word here, help, is a noun. It's not a verb. Now, you talk to the nominal man in this day and time, the, the, the nominal husband, and he'll say, I like that verse. I'm glad God made somebody to me. That means that she just does everything for me. No, that's not what it means. Absolutely not. The word help here is a noun, not a verb. Changes the whole complexity. Because what it really means is that we we share roles 
and responsibility. And sometimes those things are going to intertwine. Ladies, there's nothing wrong. Unless you have a husband like my wife. There's nothing wrong with you getting out. If you want to get out and mow a little bit, that's fine. That's okay. If you want to work on the car, Misty is a, she's figured out this mechanic thing. She's got it down pat. She can work on her car. It's okay. It's not that we are so tied up in roles. And while we're on that subject, guys, there's nothing wrong with you running the vacuum cleaner. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you helping in the laundry. If your wife is like mine, she'll probably sort for you. Because I do good with blacks, darks. I do good with whites. It's those things that are in the middle that I don't always do well with. And my wife is not happy. Something in, and I put it in with a pink shirt. And it puts this nice little tint to something that she didn't think should have that. She's not happy. It don't bother me. Does her. It's okay. I will make him a help or her a help meet. For them, we are to share domestic responsibilities. Now, I haven't said that most of the time. Most of the time, the women are going to do most of the cooking. That's the way it is in my home because the husband can't cook. But if I had to, if I needed to, I could find something, I could rustle something together that would feed us. And it wouldn't bother me a bit to do that. Not bother her, but it wouldn't bother me a bit to do that. No. And those things, those outside things that we talked about, most of the time, we're going to be doing that and we're going to be putting headlights and cars and, and, and those things. But the point we're making here is this. When God said, I will make a help meet He's saying, I am going to provide him a helper. And we're going to help each other. A healthy marriage is one where roles are not such an issue that we can't help the other person. Thirdly, there's the fruit of completion. Let's go a little farther with verse 18. I will make him a help meet. For him. That is M E E T, not M E A T. I will make him a help meet for him. It literally means fit, suitable. I will make someone to compliment him. Remember, we talked in the message last week. How that God looked at Adam and saw that he was incomplete. Remember that? It was at that time he said, Hey Adam, see all these, all these animals, fowls, everything? You name them. And why did God do that? Well, part of the reason was they needed a name. But the biggest reason was what? To make Adam aware that there wasn't anyone like him. Remember? So he created the woman. And he said, now there is one like me. But even though she was similar, she was different. She was different. Guys, there's no way that you're going to make your wife be like you. And if you could... You wouldn't be happy. No, she is uniquely different. That's one of the things that makes the relationship so wonderful. And the same thing is true, ladies. 
You can't make your spouse just like you. In fact, we're going to look at some things. I'm going to have a lot of fun here. We're going to look at some ways in which the man and the woman are different. Just totally different. Ladies, men, see if you can relate. First, we are different physically. Physically. You do know our bodies are, no wonder Scripture says, we're wonderfully made. Our bodies are so complex. Our bodies are wired. They really are. And in the complex brain system of a man, we are wired primarily to the right side of the brain. Typically males are right brain oriented. Now the female on the other hand is wired so ladies when you hear someone say my husband has half a brain they're right they're right that's the way we're made that's the way God designs us the left side which most of the time men don't get that relates to conversation. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It's going to be fun. The right side, which is really where men get the overload, it has to do with manual dexterity. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But here's a little illustration. You give a little girl a doll. Just a little doll. She'll play with it. She'll name it. She'll bathe it. She'll pull it to her little chest. You give that same doll to a little boy and he'll use it for a hammer. Because that's the way he's made. And it's the way she's made. We're not wired the same. We are different physically. Psychologically. It's logic versus emotion. Women have to know answers. They have to. They go on information overload. They've got to have details. That's why they're always asking questions. And men are spitting out these just one word answers that don't satisfy her. She wants details. She wants info. When you come in at the end of the day, the wife says, How was your day? That's fine. She don't want that. She wants to know every little detail of what your day was like. And the men are cringing. It's not that we're trying to hide anything. We're just not wired that way. We, we don't want to talk. For most of us, we're sitting there thinking, I'm just glad it's over. What's for supper? She wants details. Info. And then when it's her turn, all the guys go, oh no. She'll tell you everything that happened during the day in great detail. Every single thing. She'll let you know about it. You know why? Because that's the way she's wired. It's that left brain thing that you don't have. Thirdly, we're different emotionally. Just a little 
F Y I. Ladies, don't try to soften up your husband. You'll never do it. He's a hard head. You'll never do it. If you think I could just get him to soften up a little bit, it's not going to happen. Because he emotes differently than you. He's different. Guys, your turn. Don't try to get your wife to toughen up a little. You just need to toughen up a little. No. She doesn't emote that way. The emotional part of her is soft and tender. And as I said just a moment ago, if you could make her just like you, you wouldn't like her. Years ago, the best-selling book came out called Celebrate the Difference. It was about husbands and wives realizing we are different for a reason. God designed us that way. We are different sexually. Sexually. It's visual versus relational. Just totally different. It's physical versus emotional. Husband, if you want intimacy with your wife, her is to compliment her. A little something she doesn't expect. Don't run into the bedroom in your speedo and say, Here I am! No. It's visual versus emotional. We relate differently. And I promise you, if you can learn that lesson, there will be greater intimacy. We're made different. And it's true sexually as well. We are different conversationally. Do you know that? Now what I'm about to tell you, I know some of you ladies are going to say, you just made that up. No. No, everything I'm telling you is the truth. Every bit of it. Do you know that the average, now we're talking averages now, do you know that the average female speaks three times as many words in one day as a male? Three times. Now, now, now on, there are times that that varies. I understand. I've known some women, very much female, who were kind of quiet. I've known some guys that would talk your ear off. But on the average, the average female speaks three times as many words as a male. And according to the Today Show, which is one of the most reputable of all the, the new shows on TV, according to the Today Show, the numbers, and this blew my mind, the average number of words by a man in a day are right around 7,000. Tim, do you know you talk that much? 7,000 words. That's on the average. You know what it is for a woman? Over 20. Thousand. You say, no way. Oh yeah. Way. The average female speaks over or nearly three times the words that a normal male speaks. Then we are different relationally. As far as how we relate. Uh, let me give you an illustration. 
You can take two women and give them a valid good debit card and send them out. And they'll shop all day. And while they're looking at this and looking at that, they're talking the whole time. The whole time. A mile a minute. They just talk and shop and talk and shop at all day. Not a problem. You can take two guys, put them on a bass boat, send them out in the lake, and they can fish all day. Say hardly anything to each other. They're fishing. We're different. There's relations. That I want to remind you again. Ladies, don't, don't try to make him like you. And guys, don't try to make her like you. God made us different for a reason. He really did. Fourthly, there's the fruit of commitment. Verse 24 gives us two important principles. And here they are. We're to leave and we're to cleave. Leave and leave. I thought about how to present the word leave since I stay in trouble most of the time. Like, <clears throat> I'll just tell you what I really felt in my heart. I know, when we talked about this last week, marriage is not for everyone. There are people in, in, in life who choose to live the single life. They're perfectly happy. Marriage is not for everyone. I want to make that clear. I don't want you to go away from here and say, well, uh, I'm single and, and the preacher just trimmed my hide tonight because I'm single. And he said I should be married. No, I'm not saying that. But for most of us, because we need that completing factor, and that's that spouse, we are to leave father and mother. Leave father and mother. You know what I think is one of the saddest things that we see so many times today in our society? Who stay with mom and Because quite frankly, is that they stay with mom and dad is because they don't have a whole lot of responsibility. Mom does their laundry. It's a roof over their head. So why mess up a good thing? And they just stay and stay and stay. Here's the problem. Somewhere something happens to mom. And they're out on And they don't know how to cope. Because they've never had any responsibility. They don't want to do. When, when my wife and I got married, she was a whole lot more secure than I was. I'm thankful to God for that. Because I was one of those that had stayed with mom and dad. 27 years old. Yeah. And we went into marriage... It didn't take me long to realize the responsibilities that were involved. And to her credit, she handled it much better than I did. Much better. But as I grew up some and learned some things, we did all right. We've been married quite a while. And do pretty well. One of the biggest problems that I see today is that there are so many people who are to the world by things of their own unmaking sometimes. And they don't know how to be responsible. They're on their own. Leave. Cleave. Cleave. Let's talk about priorities for a moment. 
And remember, we're talking about relationships just a second ago. After you are married, your number one relationship should be with your Lord. He should be number one. And because you marry, that should never change. Never. He should always have top billing. If you are a child of God, He should have the number one spot in your life. As long as you're on this earth to the day you die, He ought to be number one. You know the number two relationship? The one between you and your spouse. That's number two. It's no longer you and mom. Or you and dad. It's no longer you and your sister or you and your brother. Does it mean you dissolve those relationships and don't have anything to do with them? No. No. No, a thousand times no. When it comes down to making a choice based on priority, it must always be the choice that you and your spouse make together. Even if mama doesn't approve of it, or daddy doesn't approve of it, or your brother or sister don't approve of it. Your number one relationship is to be that with the Lord. Number two, is your relationship with your spouse. And if that is not true, you've got an unhealthy marriage. The fruit of commitment. One more. The fifth one is the fruit of children. Every Every marriage will not produce children. There are going to be marriages in which the husband and wife are not able to conceive. It just can't happen. You know the ones that's always been, it's always broke my heart so much, it is those that really won't. They want a child so much. Let's face it, there are a lot of young professionals today who are very, very oriented. And I'll be honest with you, they don't want children. I wouldn't stand up here and, and grill them because they felt that way. Because I'll be honest with you, if they don't want children, they don't need children. They don't need children. If having children is a burden and they're viewed that way, that's not good. It isn't good. But the ones that I have always been so broken for are those who just want children so much and they can't conceive. Now in our day and time when there are so many children who are born to single moms and sometimes they are so young and they really are not physically and emotionally capable of raising that little child and providing for them what it needs. There are so many opportunities now for that mother, I'll be honest with you, in my feeling, to do the right thing and get them to a place like Angie's or some center like that. Because there are people on lists that Angie has who would to have a child to be able to raise. And I could give you story after story after story of children who have done that. 
Bob McGee, Bobby's friend, my friend, Bobby's sung here at church several times. Josh and his wife were not able to have children, and they love children so much. And through the center, they have now not one, but two. Two precious little children. And they're raising them. And I don't know if there's a prouder grandparent in the world than Bob McGee. Do you, Bobby? Loves those little fellas. Two little black children. Beautiful, beautiful children. God knew that those little children needed a home. And that Josh and his wife needed children. And he brought them together. And Angie was such a big part of that. I want to encourage you. I hope you love your children. If God has blessed you with biological children, I hope that you love them. And I hope that you never consider them a burden. There's going to be times they're going to break your heart. They will. I want you to do something, honestly. I want you to do this. Every time they break your heart, I want you to think back to a time that you broke your mom's heart. In your dad's heart. And for many of us, it won't be a big stretch of imagination to remember some of the things that we did. Like I was talking this morning when my mom said, I'm a sh. I'm a sh. One of the best antidotes when our children break our heart is to remember at one time we were the same way. Yet hopefully our parents loved us with unconditional love. When my mama told me that, it wasn't that she stopped loving me. No. She still loved me. But the fact remained, I broke her heart. And it broke my heart that I realized I had broke her heart. And that was worse to me than any whipping she could have ever given me. So much worse. If God has given you children, don't consider them a burden. Consider them a blessing because God does. He says the fruit of the womb is a blessing. That's how God views little children. Be thankful to God for them. Last week we looked at the formation of marriage. It's, it's start up, it's infancy. Tonight the fruit. Next Sunday, Lord's will, we're going to look at the foes. There's a lot of enemies out there to marriage. We'll look at them next week, Lord's will. Okay? All right, let's stand.